Welcome back. Well, a nationwide rail strike is looming after a second union rejects the White House's tentative deal between management and union workers. The Brotherhood of Railroad Signal Men President Michael Baldwin releasing a statement saying, quote, I have expressed my disappointment throughout the process in the lack of good faith. Without signal men, the roadways would be unsafe for the traveling public, and they shoulder that heavy burden each day. Joining me right now is the man himself. He is the president of the Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen, Michael Baldwin. Michael, thanks very much for being here this morning. We want to get your take on what's in this tentative deal. What is a no-go for the union members? Why you rejected this tentative deal? Sure. Good morning, Marina. Thank you. Uh, our members, railroad signalmen, uh, rejected this deal because they need sick time. They need to be able to take a, a day of sick day when they have the flu or they have a doctor's appointment or they have a family member who is sick. And uh, this is an issue that we've brought uh, as an organization to the table for a number of rounds of bargaining or negotiations. And uh, we haven't been able to address it. Uh, during this round of negotiations, uh, all of labor uh, uh, needed this. And we were all trying to push for it. And through PEB 250, we did not get a recommendation on it. And uh, that's that's why our members have voted the tentative agreement down. So, I mean, this keeps coming up. You've talked about this throughout rounds and rounds of negotiations, and yet the president said that there's a 24% raise in there. What about the increase in salary and benefits? Does not does that not equate to sick time for you? Uh, no, Maria. It, uh, the money doesn't equate to sick time. Uh, we have benefits. Our members earn vacation, and they earn a couple personal days. My, as a matter of fact, PEB 250 gave them a, a personal day, which uh, falls short. Uh, that that is that is leisure time. The vacation you work and earn that vacation to take time off with your family, uh, not to to burn that day or that paid day on a sick day when you have the flu. And and really, what brought this to the forefront? for us and, and all of labor in the industry actually was the pandemic. Uh, we had members that went to work in groups uh, of five, six, getting in vehicles together. One individual has COVID, then they all get it. Uh, the railroad forces you to quarantine at home without pay. So that's really what brought this to the forefront uh, uh, over the years of trying to accomplish this. This is a very good point that you make, Michael, in terms of the sick time. Everybody needs to know that if they get sick, they get the flu, they get COVID, they're going to be able to care for themselves and, and get paid for it. I, I understand that. What are the odds that you're going to take this to the uh, end and go on strike? Well, Maria, that's the last thing that we want to do as an organization. I don't believe that any rail labor really wants to strike. We want to, we want the carriers, the railroads to come to the table, and we want to bargain in good faith. Uh, you know, we're, we're on a timeline. Uh, we just had our ballot count process last Wednesday. Uh, so we are just now beginning to re-engage with the railroads. Uh, and I hope that we can come to terms that our members would be willing to ratify. So, so what's the timeline that you see that? I mean, the midterm elections are a week from today. I know Joe Biden wanted to put a pin in it until after the elections. How likely is it that we see a strike in the next couple of weeks? Honestly, Maria, I think that depends on, on whether the railroads are willing to come to the table and try and resolve this issue. Uh, obviously, it's an issue. It's an issue for more than one organization. Uh, you have two more. The, the two largest organizations are still out there. They still have to ratify. Uh, uh, you know, the timeline and the timing, it's, it's all a matter of what we can accomplish at the table. Uh, uh, you spoke with Tony Cardwell the other day, and, and I'll say the same thing. If, if we have to carry it to the end, that's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, there are other unions out there that are watching how you all deal with this, uh, how far you're willing to take it. Because we could see other, uh, you know, unions decide, well, you know what? We want sick time and we want a 24 percent plus raise at least. Are you expecting a labor to get more uh, powerful and perhaps threaten more strikes away from the rails? Uh, I, that's possible. I mean, there have been numerous uh, strikes and there have been uh, different type of job actions that have occurred in different industries across the country. Uh, 
We work under an act called the Railway Labor Act. So that governs our process as we move uh, from the bargaining table through mediation uh, to a PEB and then and then final resolution. It's it's uh, Congress or the individuals uh, that would have to take action uh, uh, during a strike to to protect the economy uh, and the transportation infrastructure and the ability to continue to supply goods. Michael, talk a bit about what the rails are carrying and how important uh, no interruption of rail service is right now to an economy that's pretty much teetering. We just got growth numbers for the third quarter, but all the expectations are that 2023 is going to be some uh, rough riding for the U.S. economy. Uh, if a rail strike happens, what would that do to the U.S. supply chain industry? Well, obviously, a strike is going to uh, is going to affect the supply chain uh, and the economy, of course. But I would say this: uh, the railroads have affected the economy and the supply chain uh, long before we came into the pandemic. They they started a process called precision scheduled railroading, and they cut the workforces and they mothballed equipment, uh, and they began to run as lean as possible. And they were making their profits from these cuts, not from investments in the infrastructure in order to grow the business. So, you know, that has played into the supply chain long before the pandemic hit. Uh, through the pandemic, they continued to furlough individuals, uh, employees in the industry, and that has not helped either. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of what the rails are carrying, walk us through the most important uh, cargo and what it is that you would look at as one of those things that would be obviously an issue for the broader economy. Sure. So uh, uh, there are many things carried on the rail. There are chemicals that industries use in order to manufacture items, uh, agricultural. Uh, there are farmers who require feed, large amounts of feed, say for chicken farmers in California. Uh, those are all items that don't just affect uh, the farmer, but it affects the, the individual, the American public. If they can't get uh, di different types of produce or they can't get different types of livestock because the farmers can't receive the feed. Uh, the diesel additives. There are many different commodities that move on the rail in bulk, and, and it's such large bulk, large bulk that these industries and these companies rely on that shipment. And if they don't get it, uh, that sometimes they have to close their doors and furlough their employees. All right. We will leave it there. You are going to the mat on sick time. We will be watching. Michael, please come back uh, to give us an update. We so appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. Michael Baldwin. We'll be right back.